Marathon Time, which is week two of Running Your Race, and we'd like to welcome Weston. I think I unplugged somebody's guitar on the way out, but don't, don't tell anybody. Shh. Hey, I'm Weston. Glad that you're here with us today. Uh, we're in the second week of this series, Gold, as we're looking for God's best in our life. And, and here's what we're doing through the series is we're trying to find that uh, or a, a path to that uh, as we look at the life of David. David is called a man after God's own heart. David is somebody who really uh, pursues God with everything that he has and does and is. And so it is my hope that as we go through the life of David, that we will see some things that perhaps we could do in our own lives that would help us to chase m more after God, get, get further in our relationship with him, and start to experience that fullness of life that we all want um, in that. And, and today's message is called X Factor because... I think there's something about David that sets him apart. Uh, here, here's the thing. David is not the only shepherd in the nation of Israel. Last week we saw that David gets anointed to be king of, of all of Israel. Israel's already got a king. The king that the people picked is King Saul, but God has now decided that he needs a man after his own heart. Saul has turned away from God, and so God chooses David and sends the prophet Samuel to anoint David as king of Israel. And so that's sort of where we left the story. Um, after that, He's going to have a lot of different adventures, and that's, we're going to start to shift today, and we're going to look at that story, maybe you've heard of it, David versus Goliath, it's a story familiar to some of you, yeah, but listen, here's what happened earlier today, um, there was some good stuff here today in David's life, and I felt like maybe, maybe not everybody was awake, so here's what I want you to, I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to say, he's about to talk to you. Say, I need you to pay attention. He's got something important that you need to pay attention to. You need to be in church. You need to hear this. This is important for you to hear this. So just let him know. Okay, all right. All right. So the question is, what's this X factor? What is it in David's life that sets him apart? Why is he anointed king? Why is he able to conquer Goliath? Why does all of this happen for him? Because let me tell you what he's not. David is not the only shepherd in Israel at this point in time. David is not the only boy who is youngest who's out tending his father's sheep. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of people just like David in his time. David isn't the only, you know, guy with a harp writing songs to God, you know. Uh, it's, it's, he's not alone in that. There's a lot of people writing songs to God. There's probably a lot of shepherd boys writing songs to God because they don't have a lot of time to do other things, uh, or rather they've got too much time and nothing else to do, and so that's what they're doing. David is not alone in this. He's not unique in that. Uh, I mean, his life situation is very common, very mundane. What is it about him that sets him apart? What is is that X factor. Now, what I mean by X factor is that thing that sets people apart that you maybe can't quite identify or define or say what it is, but when you see it, you know it. Nod your head if you know what I'm talking about. Okay. How many of you have been down to Nashville? Anybody been to Nashville? Put your hands... I'm gonna, I just don't even know what to do anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach, okay? I'm going to carry the weight of this conversation, okay? That, I'm going to do that. I, I promise you I will do the most of the talking. But if you've been to Nashville, just say Nashville. Nashville. All right, perfect. If you've been to Broadway and you've been to the honky-tonks down there or walked by them, okay? We know what's really going on. Uh, say honky-tonks with me. Okay, honky-tonks. Okay, good. That's good. All right. 
So you know what I'm talking about when I say if you walk down Nashville, you walk down Broadway, you hear all the music, right? In each place, it's like they got their cue from the guy next door and their speakers are bigger and louder and, you know, they want you to come inside. And so what do they do? They put somebody who's really good on this microphone and they blast this music out in the street and, and you go in, hopefully, and that's, that's, the, that's the business model, right? And so as you walk down Nashville, you're just impressed at how good everybody is, or at least I am. Am. You walk down that Broadway street, I mean, and every single one of those people singing in those different places, man, they could all probably, as far as I'm concerned, get a record deal someplace, right? I mean, because they're all good. And yet, as you walk by and they sound just like the person who recorded the song that's on, you know, the radio, as it, I still listen to the radio, um, and, and you hear these people, you sometimes will, if you stay long enough, you go, yeah, but there's just not that, that pizzazz, that electrical, that, uh, that, that whatever it is again we struggle to identify what it is it's that x factor it, it's there in performers it's there in people like authors right i mean there's a lot of people writing stories writing books you know but their stuff isn't out there why there's it's missing something it's that secret sauce that that's just not quite there i think probably this is true for athletes right you got a lot of folks that make it into minor league you got a lot of folks that make it into you know perhaps a draft in the nfl and yet they don't maybe have these long legendary careers now some of it might be talent but I, I guarantee you, if you look at stats, there's going to be people that just don't quite rise. Why is that? Maybe it's they didn't have a you know, good working relationship with their coach. Maybe they didn't have you know, a, a spot on the team. Maybe somebody overshadowed them in that moment. Or you know, the politics that were there, the contract that were there didn't give them the playing time they needed. Or maybe they needed to, you know, to, to sit underneath somebody for a little while and learn from them, but they had to go right in. You know, there's combinations and things that we can look at that we would go, yeah, that sort of sets this person apart and that sets that person apart and that's what i want to get at with david's life what is it that sets david apart what is it that makes him unique and stand out versus these other folks that believe in god but but didn't excel why, why is that so i want to look at the david and goliath story but before we get there i want to look at a lesser known story uh, it, it starts here in first samuel 16 verse 14 we've got the verse on the screen it says this now the spirit of the lord had departed from saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. We'll hit pause for a second because this verse makes people like freak out. Uh, what's happening here? Uh, let me tell you, my favorite book when it comes to passages that are confusing or troubling um, uh, is Walt Kaiser's book called The Hard Sayings of the Bible. It's a great book about the hard sayings of the Bible. It's it's a great title. Um, but he goes through all of these different scenarios and situations and kind of tries to explain. He's got three ideas for what this passage means. I want to share them with you. First one is this, is that uh, God sends the spirit, or rather when God's spirit leaves, it sort of creates a vacuum, and then this evil spirit comes. And, and so however you want to phrase that, God allows it, God sends it, God uses it, this spirit comes to Saul. And the reason for it is to sort of convict Saul. Saul has sort of turned away from God, uh, and he has, you know, turned towards his own interests, and he is no longer chasing after God, which is why God has rejected him. And so Kaiser, you know, suggests this idea that perhaps the Spirit is sent in a way to try to get Saul's attention and bring Saul back. And if you look through Scripture, you'll see that generally when God uh, disciplines his people, what he's doing is he's trying to bring them back. He's trying to restore them. He's trying to, you know, get, a, get attention, get their attention, you know, prick their heart and make them go, man, yeah, I need to get back to God. So this could be part of that. Uh, he says, you know, maybe this is sent to serve as a warning for future kings or for future people who God's spirit is on to remind you that, man, when you turn away from God, you know, that you, you miss out. Um, or three the word spirit here can actually be translated like mood. Uh, we use the word the same way, you know, uh, team spirit. I've got spirit. Yes, I do. I've got spirit. How about you? Um, good. This is good. Um, you know, this, this kind of thing. And so Eugene Peterson, he likes this option when he translates the message. And he says a black mood settles on Saul. So regardless of what it is or how it is, it's there. Saul is grumpy uh, to, to use a, uh, you know, a light word for this. He's a grumpy guy, and nobody wants to be around him. And so the attendants of Saul come up with a plan. Uh, we'll continue on. It says, Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. 
So let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you will feel better. Now, let's pause for a second because that's the concern, right? They want Saul to feel better. Saul wants to feel better. I, I think this is interesting. You know, God sends the spirit, I think, to convict Saul's heart and to turn him back towards him. And yet Saul is not interested in repentance. He's not interested in dealing with the root problem, which is his rebellion towards God. He says, man, I just want to feel better, not needing a show of hands. I mean, how many of us do that, right? You know, we know there's problems in our life. We've got relationships that maybe need to be worked out. We've got stuff with God that we need to deal with. But instead of dealing with it, instead of maybe confessing it or asking for forgiveness, what do we do? We just want to feel better. And so that's where Saul is. Saul says, yeah, I just want to feel better. So he says to his sentence, yeah, find somebody. Find somebody who plays well, bring him to me. And one of the servants says, well, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. Uh, he's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. So David comes to Saul and enters into his service. And it's here now that David is uh, playing the lyre. He's playing the guitar for Saul whenever Saul gets grumpy. So Saul gets grumpy, David comes in, plays the guitar, and Saul feels better. That's the, the thing. Now, here's what we need to know, is that nobody really, I mean, in my mind, wants to be with Saul at this point, because Saul is uh, rude, he's violent, um, and it's a, it's a dangerous job. You wouldn't think playing the guitar is tough, but it is difficult. Um, here, here's one vignette. The last time David plays the guitar for Saul, here's what we read. It says, An evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. And while David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded Saul as Saul drove the spear into the wall. And that night, David made good his escape. So this is the last time David plays the guitar for Saul is when he tries to, you know, kebab him with the spear that he's got. But what has led up to this point in time? I mean, how many times has Saul sort of menacingly held the spear? How many times has Saul tried to take a swing at David? And it probably didn't start there. It probably just started with Saul yelling at David, right? I mean, that's sort of how cycles of this type of behavior start. And so David's there. And David is in this place. What is going through David's mind? As I read through this text this week, I just kept thinking to myself, what is in David's mind as he's going through this? I mean, David knows who he is, right? God has anointed him. Samuel's anointed him on behalf of God to be the future king of Israel. I mean, so when you get anointed king of Israel, you think that you're going to go into the throne of the king of Israel and sit on the throne, but that's not what happens. David goes to the throne room, but he sits on the ground as he plays his guitar for crazy King Saul when he's in his grumpy mood. And so while David's playing this and Saul's yelling at him or throwing spears at him, I mean, David's got to be thinking stuff like, man, why am I here? Am I crazy for being here? He's probably thinking about Samuel, that old prophet that, you know, his hand was shaking as he anointed him. And he said, maybe Samuel lost touch with reality. Maybe Samuel's not as in tune with God as we think he is. And I bet David had times of doubt where he started to wonder, is God calling me to this? Is this really what I'm here for? But here's the thing I, I, I'm convinced of is that David didn't worry a whole lot because I know how much he prayed. You read through the book of Psalms, and you just see, you know, Psalm, you know, which is just a, a song prayer, these prayer songs, just after one after the other, written by David. David is constantly praying. And I think as David watches Saul, he probably has this moment where he thinks to himself, that could be me. Not king, but that could be me tormented by God. God, if I lose a hold of your spirit, then I've lost everything. I think we get this prayer captured in Psalm 51 when he says, do not cast from me your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. God, I need you. Here's the thing that, that I see in this is that David has humility. David is incredibly humble. And, and with David being humble, he is open to God. David is humble. He is open to God. And, and David knows that all that is good in him has come from God. And David knows that if he, loses, if he loses the spirit of God, he's going to be transformed from the anointed king to a spear-throwing madman. And he does not want that. And so while King Saul has his fits of rage, David prays and he says, God, do not cast your spirit from me. 
this is, I think, one of the pieces that makes David so unique is, is hu his humility, his humbleness. He is open to God. Now, but that's not it, right? I mean, there's definitely more to this. Because David isn't just sort of this humble guy, you know, this nice humble guy that plays the guitar. He's got a he's he's got a, a bigger grip on who he is and what he's doing. Because he might be there playing the guitar, but he knows that God has called him to be king. And so right now he's in this place where God is shaping him to be who he's called him to be. And that's a hard place to be, right? When you know, perhaps, you know, where God has called you, you have your sights set on something, and you just know that right now, maybe God is preparing you for that place. It's even harder when you don't know what that looks like, and you don't know the place that you're going to end up, but you have to have the sense that, man, God is shaping me here. And this is what I think we see next in David, is this determination. He is not defined by others. When I'm using the word determination here, what I really mean is that David is determined who he is because God has already told him. You know, King Saul has probably questioned his, you know, lineage, his parentage, you know, his mother, who his father was. He's probably questioned all these things while he's playing the guitar. And, you know, he's had to endure that. But David is determined. He has predetermined, maybe that's the better way to say it, he has predetermined who he is because God has told him that. And so it doesn't matter what Saul says. He knows who he is. Now, it's, it's getting close to the time of the Olympics, and, and I'm a big fan, um, that they're starting to already play the, um, the backstory reels, you know, those, those footages that, you know, tell you where this athlete is and where they've come from. Uh, we have a, a little running joke in our house. Uh, occasionally, we watch The Voice, and we've, we're pretty convinced that you don't get on that show unless you have a really tragic backstory that they can, you know, show um, as you get further along. Um, so that way, you know, they can see that, you know, your dog got run over by a, a concrete truck or something, and, and you know, that changed your life. Um, you know, and the same thing's true with the Olympics, right? They, they, all of these stories, they're going to have of, of how these people have overcome these things. And, and it, it feels a little cliche because of the way it gets done, but it's a real thing, right? We all deal with that in our lives. We've all got relationships that are broken. We've all got, you know, habits and hang-ups and addictions that, that you've had to overcome. We've all got issues in our lives where we've had to sort of say, I've got to step over this. I've got to step beyond this. I've got to move past this if I'm going to, to step into what God is calling me to. Now, David, we'll read that he has faced some very real challenges and problems. He has faced off against lions and bears and tigers. Oh, my. He has faced all of these things while he's keeping the sheep. But I do not think that those are the things that have challenged David most. I think what's challenged David most is the criticism by the people who are closest to him. Now, we don't get this part, but um, we see that David goes to the battlefield to meet Goliath uh, on an important mission from his father. Uh, David's older brothers are in the army. David is at home tending the sheep. Uh, David's anointed king of Israel. They're out fighting. So you already kind of see this, this disconnect. And Jesse knows that they're in this stalemate. And so he sends David... But he doesn't send David like with, you know, armor, uh, sword, shield, war horse, chariot. He didn't send him with any of those things. He sends him with snacks. He says, hey, David, um, could you take some cheese and crackers to your brother and maybe take some bologna to the commander? And could you do all this stuff, David? Take some snacks to, to, the, to the battlefield. You know, help those guys out uh, and then bring back some good news. And like every father of a teenage son, Jesse says, and stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble, David. That's what he tells him. And so David goes off. And again, what's going through David's mind? You know, dad doesn't even believe in me, right? He sends me to the battlefield with cheese and crackers. I'm going with cheese and crackers, and there's a battle going on, and nobody believes in me. And so then he gets there, and he sees Goliath, and Goliath is talking trash, and he sees all the army terrified and scattered and afraid, and he starts to ask questions like, who is this guy, and what are you going to do about it, and is anybody going to do anything about this, and, and why are you letting him talk like that about God, because God's not going to put up with this stuff. And, and you have this, this whole sort of questioning that David does in the camp. Uh, you know, and then who should find him but his older brother? So dad sends him with cheese and crackers and his older brother. Here's what his older brother says to him. It says, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? 
And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? In other words, you're not important. Your previous job wasn't important. What are you doing? He says, I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is, and you came down only to watch the battle. David, you're just here to gawk. You're just here to, you know, watch everybody else. Get back, go home, take your cheese and crackers, and we'll see you later. This is David's life. This is who people are telling him who he is. This is who his dad told him he's going to be. This is who his brother's telling him who he's going to be. And now, what's he going to do? Now, I know for a lot of folks, you get people that tell you who you are, and you start to believe it. And you start to think, man, that must be what I am. I must, I must be good for nothing, because that's what everybody tells me. And you start to believe it. You start to internalize it. You start to say, man, that must be reality. But David is determined. He is predetermined who he is because God has already told him who he is. And so he says, no, I mean, I'm more than that. And so he starts to ask around, and he starts to say, man, I'm, I'm ready for this. And this is where we see that character trait, I think, that we would all put with David, and that is courage. He is ready for a new challenge. David is ready for something new. He's tired of running the cheese and cracker route. He's tired of tending the sheep. He, he's ready for battle. And so what's going to happen? King Saul's going to call him in. He's going to say, hey, you know, David, I hear you're asking around about this. David say, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for this. Now, I want to pause for a moment because it's easy to sort of throw rocks at all the, the soldiers at this point in time because none of them have stepped up to the, the call. None of them have answered uh, Goliath's challenge. And so we might say, man, they're all cowards. They're all a bunch of, you know, they're, they're not good for anything. I mean, here are the army, and, you know, the whole army is afraid to fight one guy. You know, who is this? You know, who are these people? But here's reality. These are soldiers. These are seasoned, trained soldiers. They're fighters. This isn't their first fight. They know that as they look at Goliath that they're facing a new kind of enemy. They've been through boot camp. They know how to face somebody that's their size, and they know how to do battle with normal people, but this is a new kind of person. Goliath's just built different. I mean, they just don't know what to do with this guy. It's a new kind of battle. And the old training and the old weapons, they're not ready for it. I mean, think about it. We're entering into a time right now in our, our history where, you know, guns and bombs, they're, they're quaint. You know, they're antiquated. They're old. When you can shut down an entire oil pipeline with a few keystrokes half a world away. You know, we're waging war in a whole new way. This is what's happening here. There's a whole new battle being fought. David versus Goliath. People don't understand him. These soldiers are going, I don't know how to fight a guy like that. And so when David comes and says, I'm ready. I'm ready for it. Here's, here's what happens. He says to Saul, he says, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, this is me, will go and fight him. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and fight him, says David. And so Saul decides that you know, he needs to be kind of responsible. He's you know, a little bit cowardly to send David out, this little boy. Um, and so here's what, here's what Saul says. He says, Saul says to David, go and the Lord be with you because I won't. You know, that's, that's in the parenthesis there. Nobody else will be with you, David, so the Lord will be with you. Uh, and Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He puts a coat of armor on him, a bronze helmet on his head. Probably not his good one, because he knows it's not coming back. And he fastens his sword over his tunic, tries walking around, and David says, I cannot go in these. I'm not used to them. And so he took them off. And he took his staff. He chooses five smooth stones from the stream. Uh, if you want to know why he chose five smooth stones, look on Google, and you will find a thousand on God for your strength. Have you thought about that? I mean, let's say you realize, man, that your marriage, the reason it's maybe struggling is because God has never been present in there. Yeah, you go to church together, but you've never said, God, would you come into our home? Would you come into our hearts? Would you come into our life? And it's time for you to, to, to do that, to open yourself up to them. What's it going to take? Well, if you kind of follow this through, a little bit of humility, where you look each other in the eye, maybe you ought to look in the eye of your kids and say, listen, we got this wrong. It takes humility to admit it. And you've got to say, man, we got this wrong. We need God. We're determined that we're going to be that, that family that God is describing, you know, where we are together for life. Man, that's who we want to be. And we're going to have the courage to stick it out because God is going to be here with us. Man, it starts with faith. It starts with us saying, God, I'm going to put my faith in you. There might be something in your own life you're dealing with. It could be, could be you know, something you know, dark like some addiction. It could be you know, something in terms of just a fear that keeps holding you back from stepping into what you believe God is calling you to, to do and to become. You'll never find out until you have the courage to take that step. 
friends, what is it? Where do you need God to show up? I, I think God is calling us to, to new places through faith. I think God's calling the church to new places in faith. If you believe that, do you want to say amen? Do you believe that, the, that God is calling the church to some place in faith? Listen, here's what I see as I look out across our nation. I mean, this is true across the globe, too. I mean, I, I see so much division. And, and the folks have said it right when, you know, they say a divided nation needs a united church. There is nothing more true than that. And I look at the state of the church, and I see how divided the church is. And it breaks my heart because we've got red churches and blue churches and we've got black churches and white churches and we've got rich churches and we've got poor churches and all these churches are fragmented and separated and divided. And see, I think God's calling us back to be a united church, a church that says, listen, the, the tent of Christianity is pretty big and it can tolerate both parties, and it can tolerate all ethnicities, and it can tolerate all races. It can tolerate, it can take and accept and welcome in so much. We made the tent, God's tent, so small when his house is so big. Friends, it's going to take courage for us. If we're going to be a church that's going to step forward and say, man, we believe we should unite in Jesus Christ, it's going to take some humility. We're going to have to admit, man, we got some stuff wrong. We're just going to have to own it. We're just going to have to own it. We got stuff wrong. We're going to have to own that. We're going to have to have some determination. Say, listen, you know, I know that people might say the church is antiquated and quaint, but God has called it the body of Christ. It is the hope for the world. Man, we're going to be that. We're going to let God determine who we are, not other people. And it's going to take some courage to step out into some messy things and some things that people will disagree with, into some stuff that people will say, man, I don't know about getting involved in that. It's going to take some courage to do something new because God is calling us to something new. Friends, there's so much waiting for us if we will just step out in faith. That's the X factor. It's God at work. I want to pray for us right now. And as we bow our heads, I just want to ask if perhaps there's somebody here who you're saying, man, I really want God to do something new in some part of my life. I don't know what it is. If you put your hand up, I want to pray for you right now. All right. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for those that have had the courage to stick their hand up and say that they need you to do something new in their life. God, I don't know what that is, whether it's in, it's in their marriage, whether it's in their heart, it's in their mind, it's in something that's holding them back, God. I, I know that in this room, God, we've all, whether we recognize it or not, God, we all need you to do something new. There's stuff in us that's tired and old, and it needs to be replaced. And so, Jesus, I, I pray that through the power of your Spirit, you would come and refresh in us and rebuild in us and do something new in us, God. Would you give us the humility to be open to you, to accept what we've done wrong in the past? God, would you give us the determination to, to, to pre-decide that we're going to only allow you to tell us who we are? Would you give us the courage, Jesus, to step into what you're calling us to? And in all of this, God, would you give us the faith to depend on you for strength in everything? pray this in your name right now, Jesus. Amen. This morning, um, this, this continues, and if you need some time to pray, you're welcome to stay seated. If you, we, we leave the baptistry open. Sometimes folks like to come up and kind of wash their hands in there and say, God, I want a fresh start here today. We'll leave that for you. If you want to pray with somebody, I'd love to pray with you. Uh, if you're joining us online and you want to talk about this, we'd love for you to just contact us at the office. You can email us. Um, you can send us a message through Facebook. Uh, we'd love to be in touch with you. Um, that's what we're here for. That's what the church is for, is to help us each take our next step towards Jesus Christ, to step into that life that God's calling us to. Why don't you stand? We're going to sing. How high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? And oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the other side. 
Endure how long if I chased rivers from lonely seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. Cause in the highlands and the heartache You need the more or less inclined Oh, I would search and stop at nothing You're just not that hard to find So I will praise you on the mountain so I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are Yes, you are, Lord So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is the highlands in the heartache all the same whoa whoa and so how far beneath your glory does your kindness extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinners past And oh how fast would you come running If just to shadow me through the night Trace my steps through all my failures And walk me out the other side but Who could tear a sin that mountain the valley hill called Calvary But for the one I call Good Shepherd Who like a lamb was slain for me Whoa So I will praise you on the mountain Yes I will And I will praise you in the mountains in my way you're the summit where my feet are. Yes, you are, Lord. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands, in the heartache, all the same. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. Whatever I walk through, whatever I am, your name can move the mountain. Wherever I stand, if ever I would walk through the valley of death, I'll sing through the shadows my song of sin. Whatever I would walk through, wherever I am, your name can move the mountains. Wherever I stand, if ever I would walk through the valley of death. I sing through the shadows, my song never sin, my song never sin. Whoa, whoa, you sing it out, my song never sin. Whoa, whoa, just from the gravest of Come the pastures we call grace A mighty river flowing upward From the deep but empty grave 
seated. Right now we come to our time of communion, and we know churches do this a little different, so we want you to know how we do it here. If you're a believer in Jesus, uh, you're welcome to participate. Um, we serve this from God's table, not ours. Uh, we do this because Jesus asked us to remember him and to remember his work. So I just want to give you a moment to do that, to thank Jesus for being that source of strength that we access through our faith. And then I'm going to come back and lead us together in taking communion. of the body of Christ. Now the cup reminding us of his blood. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for the cross. We're thankful for the power that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you that he's come to do for us what we could not do for ourselves to set us free from sin, to send us the gift of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And so this week, God, we pray that we would be mindful of the power we have in Jesus, that we would be aware of the presence of your Spirit, and that, God, we would be sensitive to what you call us to, that you'd give us the courage, God, to step out in new ways this week as we experience and share your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, it's been great worshiping with you today. I want to remind everybody that starting August, I think it's first, I think it's the very first Sunday of August, whatever that is, I think it's the first, we're back to one service, 1030, it's going to be great having everybody together in one roof, so just be planning on that, uh, joining us at 1030 in August, and then also that first Sunday we're starting our very first Circle Up, it is a class, sort of an introduction uh, for new folks at Bowling Green Christian Church, I'm going to be leading that class. It's going to be just kind of a casual thing we're going to do over in the connection room. And so if you're newer to the church, got questions, um, want to find out more about how to get involved, join us for Circle Up. That'll be that first Sunday. It's going to be at 9 o'clock, so it's going to be the before service starts at 1030. So just plan on that 9 o'clock, August 1st is Circle Up. All right, I want to introduce you to somebody who has got incredible sense of fashion and style, Bob Fulcher, who is now our, a, um, our leader of community groups, helping us out here. He's got some announcements for you, so. You know, I was told, I read a story that if you wore a big Hawaiian shirt up here, you'd get a response. So it's we'll true. see. It's um, true, Bob. We're about ready to start the kickoff and sign-ups for our community groups uh, efforts for this fall. Uh, they'll start in about three weeks. And community groups is a great opportunity to make new friends, to learn more about yourself, to learn more about Jesus. You know, coming out of this pandemic, people are in a need for a community more than they've been in my lifetime that I'm aware of. And a few weeks back, Weston talked very well about needing Jesus and needing community. Well, this is the time and the place. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't been part of community groups up to now, to think about signing up as we get into August, but also to invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers. Uh, it doesn't make any difference if they don't belong to church here. It doesn't make any difference if they even know that Jesus 
is there for them at this point in time. This is a great time to get them involved. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, but with the new group, we also need uh, new leaders for the group. So if you're interested at all in facilitating a group, I'd love to talk to you. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to be an experienced group leader. All you have to have is a heart for Jesus and a heart for other people. We will train you. We'll give you ideas. We'll provide resources. We'll even have a place for you to meet. Um, but if you're willing to consider taking that on, uh, I'd love to talk to you. I'll be out in the lobby afterward, but my information, my contact information is in the app, so you can get a hold of me anytime there, too. So I'd love to talk to you soon, and who knows what the, the shirts bring. That's it, man. Thanks, Bob. Let's thank Bob. <clears throat> Hey, we are going to dismiss this morning with a benediction here from the book of Hebrews. So why don't you stand and receive this as we end our service together. Now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he make you complete in everything good so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed, church. Have a great Sunday.